Tonight, we explore Arthur Lovejoy's very interesting work called The Great Ch Chain of Being. What it is, is to correct Plato. There's a whole development of thought that comes out of Europe and America that has its primary goal taking Plato off his pedestal and dropping him somewhere else. The idea of the great chain of being is the Platonic idea that there is the good or the one, the idea of being, or the intelligibles, and I think we're familiar with it, but I'll put it here. It's also called the, the good or the one. The realm of intelligence, being, vitality, soul, world soul, soul and body, down to just body or physical. Now, this is all linked. See, it's all linked. It's called the great chain of being. Specifically, however, this idea is how these three are connected. For Lovejoy, this idea has gone through history, especially Europe, and he sees it, his exploration of the great chain of being and his work. He calls it the history of a failure. This, is, this idea is a failure. This is a total failure. And so the whole goal of his work is to show that this great chain of being, you can understand, if you understand it correctly, you'll see that it is necessary to convert it, not being, but into becoming. Now, what's interesting about this work is it gives us an opportunity to talk about many ideas behind it that play a big role for anyone entering into the world of philosophy and thought. So it gives us an opportunity to what I call a catharsis. Now, a particularly interesting woman who's involved in philosophical counseling by the name of Shulmet Schuster expressed it to me in a very fine way. She said, before you can really get into the mind you have to be able to see that there's, cert there's a certain language that you have to purify yourself of. You have to go through a catharsis. And she said, we, are, we accept languages so readily and use them that we don't realize that they have all kinds of assumptions and presuppositions behind them. She had a particularly interesting view. She said, modern man has picked up through the schools and literature the language of psychoanalysis. Psychology. She said, therefore, when you try to explore people yourself, you're apt to use this language. And she says, it's, it has only a very limited value, and therefore, the whole problem of exploring philosophically people's difficulties and problems and exploring the dimension of the mind is that you have to rid them of this. Well, there are other kinds of myths that are equally important to get rid of. They come from the political realm as well. But I would like to address that issue, the catharsis of the problem of the scholar and the philosopher. We don't meet in our culture anymore philosophers. We meet scholars. Scholarship rules in our culture, scholarship. 
Right? Professors rule. They're not the same thing. Scholarship proceeds in a certain very interesting way, totally different than the Platonic philosopher. A scholar, is, as Lovejoy does, he has an idea that he wants to develop, and that, I, that is that this great chain of being is a failure. Now, how is he going to do that? He's a scholar. Well, first of all, you take what you really think and you put that in the end of the book. You never introduce it. You want to then take the idea of the great chain of being and show its development historically. That's the key. Show it historically. That's the eyes through which scholars see. Therefore, they want to show a development and they are primarily interested in showing how, how insightful they are. They see them themselves as the last step in an ongoing process. They are on the last wave of many waves throughout history and they see themselves as in the, that final wave and they are on the they're, um, they're, they're surfing the last wave. They're right there on the top of the wave. Now, this is also behind this is the historical view, which is linked also with the evolutionary view, the evolution. Things are getting better and better. So behind this is also the idea of progress. They all fit together. Now, how are you going to proceed? Well, what you're going to do is you go through your reading lists and you list all of the scholarship that's been done on Plato. And you consider what all the scholars have said and you choose among them a series of thinkers who themselves, in this analysis of Platonic thought, You choose them with care because you want to show that in your choosing them, the choices themselves go through a progression. And therefore, you know they're going to start with someone who takes a certain modest position in respect to the goal that he wants to achieve. Right? And then you show other thinkers that finally culminate in the thinker that most represents your own position. That's the way to do it. Now, each one of these thinkers, each one of these thinkers is a scholar. Now, what's, what, different, what kind of point do we make when we say the difference between a scholar and a philosopher? That's very upsetting to many people. A philosopher tries to live it. The scholar tries to study it. They're different. The way of the scholar is to try to understand each of the major works that he's involved in first by studying it through someone else. They call it a definitive work. You want to find the definitive study on Kant. You want to find the definitive study on Plato. You want to find that particular source, that expert who can represent that thinker from whom you can then make your conclusions. Now, the idea that maybe you should live philosophy, maybe do it, and find how well you can accept the ideas of a particular thinker like Plato, and see through those particular eyes, a Platonic eyes, and to try to in some way include that vision in what you're doing is not a scholarship. It's not scholarship. That's taking it personal. And that's against the whole idea of scholarship. You don't take things personally. Scholarship, therefore, is a very curious kind of game. You don't make particular points that you can't support from texts. And when they're at variance with your own experience, unless you can find some expert who coincides with your point, you're left without any source to establish your point. Now, 
This is particularly, scholarship is a particular interesting phenomenon that emerged from Europe. It's a European invention. Now, as a consequence, Europeans see themselves in a culture. They often think of themselves as the heirs to the classic world, as if they are what I call, this is called the king of the hill phenomena. They want to see themselves in an ongoing exploration in which they themselves have reached the highest point in the development. They want to see themselves, therefore, as being able to reach that high point which others have only approached. And you want to reach that by studying scholarship. You read books about books. You don't try to master a work. There are so many things you have to study to be a scholar that you simply can't study all the books. So what do you do if you can't read all the books you have to write about? Well, you read about those people who have a reputation of knowing those works most clearly, and then you study what they said about those works, and you link their thought together with what you've done, and you pull it into a rational argument, and that's scholarship. Europe and Europeans enjoy this approach. It has an authority to it. It has a nice authority to it, and they treasure their own particular authorities more than they would any other authority. French, German, Italians, English. Now, they have another particular commitment, and this is perhaps most, this whole idea can most clearly be seen in their view of history. Um, it, it has often been said in the coffee shop that I attend that when you scratch a European skin, you'll find a historian somewhat underneath the skin. Every European is a kind of a historian. A certain kind of history they represent. Same thing, same thing. They see everyone that came before them as only approaching what they're doing. They see in history, they see a spirit. They see a spirit moving through history. And that spirit they see and is the is the uh, is, is, a, is a revelation is God. God moves through history for them. They're very much involved with people like Hegel. The important thing about it is, you cannot anticipate where it's going. The next wave is going to occur. The next wave is going to have its origin. When someone in Europe wakes up to a new possibility, he can express it, he can give voice to it. He can see what's ripe for development in his age. He's the far-seeing one. He's a far-seeing one, that's what they're called, far-seeing. They know what's ripe for the age, what's ripe for the development, and they body within themselves the, the whole program for the next age. And so they, for, therefore, they're world conscious individuals, they're world historical individuals. And they're the Hitlers, the, they're the Caesars. They enter into history and they shape it. And they cannot be anticipated. because they see what's going on. They see what's ripe for, for development. Therefore, in a very clear way, everything is contingent. It's arbitrary. It's idiosyncratic. There's no overall plan. Take a look at the difference between, say, a historian in the classical world, like Thucydides, Thucydides could see what was going on in his age, and he said, I think I'm seeing something so significant that it's likely that I can express it with such clarity that future ages will be able to use it to see what's going on in their age. He could see that in his situation, he could see that what he was reporting could become a model for understanding. 
Therefore, models, ideals are created so that they can be used to understand the moment. To that degree, everything, therefore, moves through history and expresses these models in one way or another. And the whole game, therefore, of a classic historian would be to see the relationship between the particular stage of development of a city-state or a nation and that model and see whether you can then anticipate and learn from it. Well, that means, therefore, if there are models, if there are archetypes, if there are models and archetypes, then everything then can be understood in terms of them. Therefore, the world is rational. There's a certain rationality in the world, a certain rationality. There's a rationality. Model copy, rationality. Now, when you extend that and say the absolute rationality of the whole cosmos, then that's what our friend Lovejoy is going to, is going to say is the relationship between this realm, which he calls the idea of the good, The relationship between the idea of the good, now I'm going to change this because he doesn't use this language, is that the idea of the good and the natural world, nature and history. Now, as he understands the Greek world, Plato's world, he says, look here, this idea of a model and archetype, says rational, if you take that in the extreme form as absolute rationality, which means, therefore, this idea of the good for him is a set of, it's a set of all possible ideas, all possible <clears throat> uh, things in creation. It's closed. The idea of the good is what? The set of all possible things in creation. Uh, but they're only there potentially. Only as a potential. And therefore, they have to then come into the natural world. They have to then and somehow be exhibited in history to gain their actuality. Now, Lovejoy says, this view that everything is determined by this idea of the good, which is the set of all possible things that can be and might be in creation, and that the nature and history is nothing other than a mirror image of the divine, idea of the good is what he wants to criticize and show its absurdity because he reaches the point in the work where he says the absolute rationality of the cosmos is simply unbelievable. This is totally unbelievable. This whole thing is unbelievable. This whole thing is unbelievable. And it's the goal of this work to try to show why it's unbelievable. Now, I want to go back to several things about this. But this is a view that is heralded. And many people use it as a test do you understand Lovejoy? Do you understand that this whole Greek ideal is unbelievable? If you understand Lovejoy, you will see that you will have to consider what we just put on the board is totally unbelievable. Then you are a modern. 
That's what it is to be a modern, you see. A modern is someone who believes they have very good reason for dismissing the past because the present is so different. There's a split between these two worlds. A modern, therefore, is in revolt of the past. Not any past, this past, Plato. Now, what is a modern? For Lovejoy, the person who expresses this idea of being a modern is the romanticist. Now, this idea of the romanticist, which I enjoy exploring, we're going to have to put words on it, right? What is this idea of the romanticist? Now, he uses a couple of central figures to try to make his position. Schelling is one of them, and another one is Aachen. Now, Aachen is a very interesting person. He wrote something quite interesting, and he expresses most clearly <clears throat> what Lovejoy believes to be the fullest expression of the truth of things which if you see and understand, you too will see that this ancient view is dead. Well, let's do it. This is, let's now move into this idea of Aachen's. Now, here's the problem. Here is the flow of time. In time, all things are moving and moving and turning and twisting and doing a variety of things. But through it all, there is something discernible in nature, in nature and in history. And we want to see if we can understand Aachen's view of it. The primary thing is that everything that's going on can be expressed in just a couple of ideas. One is what Lovejoy calls the principle of plenitude. Not just a fancy word for manyness. The principle of plenitude. That is to say that what is going on in the world of nature is many, many forms of things, each competing for time and space, many forms evolving, many forms clashing in the struggle to survive. But the key to all of that is that each thing is, is in some way expressing its own uniqueness. Each thing is totally unique. Now, a unique thing, and in its uniqueness, is its essence. Let me change that and put this in terms of person and people, all right? People. Here's one. The uniqueness of that person, when we talk about the uniqueness of that person, we use the term individual. A unique individual, right? A unique individual. And in our culture, many, many people spend a great deal of time and energy in trying to become one of these things. Because in the uniqueness, you show your essence not in trying to become like some ideal, no ideals, you must protect your individual difference, your individual distinctiveness. And that's it, see? It's that peculiar, unique quality. That's what's emerging through nature. That's what's going on in nature and everything. 
for everything, no matter how, how much it may look like something else, there's always something particularly different about it, and that difference, if you can grasp it, is its particular essence. Therefore, the whole history, the whole evolution, is nothing other than this very essential essence emerging. That's evolution, an emerging distinctiveness. Now, I want to call that a radical evolution. All right, or a radical evolutionism. Well, what's coming through this? What is that's working its way through all of this, showing itself most distinctively again and again and again? What did we see it? What did we say it was in history? God. Hegel, that's what's moving through history. If you want to understand God, you, you see how God expresses himself in history. Because the will of God is, expresses itself in history. Ah, if that's the case then, through evolution, God expresses himself. God is being expressed. And not in being, not, right? Being expressed. Being expressed not as being, that's stable, static, but as becoming. Well, do you know what that means? Man, therefore, in his uniqueness, is expressing God. Therefore, man is God, wholly manifested. Because what's that uniqueness again? That's the particular essence. That's the intelligible essence for love joy. Therefore, this radical evolution is nothing other than God moving through history and nature. So Occam says, man is God wholly manifested. Therefore, he adds, the philosophy of nature is the science of the eternal trans transformation of God into the world. That's what it is. The philosophy of nature, what's driving nature, is nothing other than the science of the eternal transformation of God into the cosmos, into the world. That's what's going on. That's its particular uniqueness. That's why artists, artists express this far more than anyone else, because they see the need to be unique and to show that individual uniqueness. And therefore, the artist becomes the, the kind of uh, most fully <coughs> Uh, developed individuals since they are showing and are aware of their own need to be individual, unique, both in the art and as, a, as they are themselves. Therefore, God never is, now, is, you know, God never is, another word for is, is being. Right? You can't say, you know, God never is, God is not being. Remember what we had before with the idea of intelligence, being, and vitality as the idea of the good? God is not being, only wholly coming to be through nature and history. Coming to be is the major idea, see. God realizes himself through nature and history. The old view is the idea of potentiality and actuality. Let's look at that just for a quick moment. He quotes and he goes into Plato's Timaeus. There's God as the demiurgos. Right, God the creator, right, maker. God has an idea, right. and he contemplates that idea, much like an artist would contemplate the model that he wants to work, and so with the skill naturally possesses, using that as a model, he creates the cosmos. Therefore, the cosmos is a copy 
The idea in the mind of God is called the idea of the good. Idea in the mind of God also being intelligence, vitality as a unity. Therefore, these terms are always hyphenated. Now, what's the status of this idea of the good in the mind of God? Now, here's two ideas that are very important, <coughs> especially to Aristotle. So we'll use it. Potentiality and actuality. Consider a seed has been planted. And just the seed in the ground. Would you agree it has only actualized, actualized is the same word as developed or manifested. It hasn't actualized anything, it's just a seed. Therefore, it's actualized nothing. But potentially what's in the seed is 100% of it because it hasn't yet developed. Now, we can wait a certain time, and we can see it then germinate and develop a bit. And we can say, hey, look here, 25% of it has been actualized. It has 75% to go. And then we can look at it again, and we can say, by heavens, 50-50. And then we can say 10 to 90%, can't we? Until finally, it has used up all its potential, and now it's 100% actual. And it's ready to be dropped in yet as another seed and the cycle goes on. Now that seed then, that seed for these thinkers, Aristotle and Lovejoy, is an unrealized potential. It has yet to be realized. It must be put into existence before it becomes actual. Therefore, for them, it's abstract. Abstract means empty of all content. Empty. Right? Just, just a vague emptiness surrounding a possibility. It, there's nothing real about it. It hasn't become actual. Therefore, they want to call this idea of my God just an abstract unrealized potentiality. Real life is the moment, the moment in nature, the moment in history, right? each moment, each moment. That's what's real. This is only an abstract idea in the mind of God. Therefore, as you compare the two, you can see how significant it is because the latest progress, evolution, is always there for the latest manifestation. And therefore, to that degree, all nature is showing itself, as it were, exhibiting or manifesting the idea of God, and the will of God being unfolded. And uh, Therefore, God needs the universe in order to be. And the universe is coming to be. Therefore, God is coming to be. Matter of fact, God is nature. Emerging. Now, just to have a little fun, I'll read you a couple of quotes just to... contingent world. Now, I'm just going to read a couple of sentences about this 
contingent world. It's unpredictable right? because what is emerging but the very spirit of God. It is, in short, a contingent world. Its magnitude, its pattern, its habits, which we call laws, have something arbitrary, idi idiosyncratic about it. That means particularly unique about them. But if this were not the case, it would be a world without character. Big word for them. Character. You have to have character. What's character being unique, being distinctive? Without power of preference or choice among the infinity of possibilities, of possibles. If we may employ the traditional anthropomorphic language of the theologians, we may say that in it, will is prior to intellect. And that's an interesting notion. The history of the idea of the chain of being, insofar as that idea presupposed such a complete rational intelligibility, intelligibility of the world, is the history of a failure. More precisely and more justly, it's the record of an experiment in thought carried on for many centuries by many great and lesser minds which can now be seen to have had instructive negative outcome. The world of time and change, this at least our history has shown, is a world which can neither be deduced from nor reconciled with the postulate that existence is the expression and consequence of a system of eternal and necessary truths. As such a system could manifest itself only in a static and constant world. And since empirical reality is not static <clears throat> and constant, the image does not correspond with a supposed model and cannot be explained by it. The model cannot be used to explain the particular because the uniqueness, the absolute uniqueness and unpredictability of the emerging uh, forces in evolution and history show that there is no model apparent. Therefore, this, this, this idea rests upon some idea of faith, he says, which we can abandon. Thus, at last, the Platonic or the Platonistic scheme of the universe is turned upside down. Not only had the original complete an immutable chain of being been converted into becoming, in which all genuine possibles are indeed destined to, to realization, grade after grade, yet only through a vast, slow unfolding in time. But now God himself is placed in, or identified with, this becoming. progress of the world, the gradual manifestation of self-realization of God, is a struggle against opposition, since the full possibilities of being were not realized all at once and are not yet realized. There must be in the original nature of things be some impediment, some principle of retardation destined to be triumphed over, indeed, but without suffering, the t temporary defeats. 
The life force advances, fumbling by trial and error. The other view, Platonic view, it's a dead God, not the God that lives and strives in nature and in man. Okay. Let me now stop and talk about this rather interesting idea he has, you see. Let's see whether we can make it clear the point that he is making that we have here. For love joy, let me put it in another same thing we've said before. For him, this concept of <clears throat> the idea of the good is the idea which is the model for all creation, model for the cosmos. Therefore, the copy here is nothing other than the manifestation. Now, the way he understands this is not uncommon. For him, this word, he doesn't recognize that it's a technical word. Not many Unfortunately, not many people do. That's a Greek word, idea. That's a Greek word. So we've talked about that before. We'll do it again tonight. Look here. Let me first talk about it the way Lovejoy understands it. For him, it's a concept. Then there are many concepts. These concepts are nothing other than what must be realized here. That's the idea of the mirror. There is something here that is real. Our existence is a copy and he says this view is absurd and it's absurd because it's static. There's nothing here that can't be there. Everything in the natural world must have its proper form in this realm of ideas. It's a model copy. It's a mirror. Therefore, it's static. Nothing new can evolve. There's no room for contingency. There's no room for chance. There's no room for anything new, unique or individual. Now, he's taking the Greek concept of the idea of the good and he understands it this way. In order to do that, being a scholar, he has to look for people who have that idea. That is, they understand Plato that way. So naturally enough, he's going to quote them and he's going to quote them and each one of them is going to be a scholar, not a philosopher, a scholar. He's not going to look at Plotinus. He's not going to look at Proclus. He's not going to look at Plato. He's not going to do those things. He's going to go to his authorities. He's going to cite a group of authorities in order to make that point. And if you take a look at the authorities he uses, you can see that he's chosen them with care in the way in which we described a few minutes ago. But what would that look like if we used Platonic thinkers? 
What would happen if we used uh, Plato? Oh, look here. Let's try it. Let, let, let me introduce something here. In order to make the point that he's making, all right, now we have to keep, this is the way he understands the idea of the good. That's the way he understands it. Remember his idea in time, everything unique, right? Individualistic coming through here, through which God emerges, right? through all those differences, and God is struggling to become. Therefore, Lovejoy says, there are two ideas in Plato, the idea of the good and the good itself. Now, since the idea of the good itself has been said to be equivalent to the highest idea of God, and stands above the idea of the good, his system isn't going to work. Because that would just be, his system would, his system would only be saying that this model that he is using doesn't match this model that we just drew on the board, but it doesn't therefore say that God is emerging in this process. Therefore, he has a great idea. He says, you know what? The truth of Platonic thought is that there is no difference. The good is the idea of the good. There's no difference between them. Well, now the good or God is equivalent to the idea of the good. And therefore, the model of the cosmos is nothing other than the idea of God, the idea of the good. And now he can then be closer. He can now attack this idea since he has done nothing other than reduced it to an absurdity. Now let's see if we can show that. Keep the one we just did in mind. The key point here is that the idea of the good for him is identical to the good itself. But in the Republic, very clearly, without any difficulty, the good is said to have begotten the idea of the good. Therefore, it is its source. It is not equivalent to it. Second, now, the word idea means to behold, to see. If one were to behold the good, it would be an experience, since to see is to experience. The highest experience you can have in Plato is this thing called the idea of the good. He gives many names to it. Now, if one were to experience it, experience it now, one would experience it as a vast beauty, what he calls a perfection of beauty in the symposium, an overwhelming beatific experience. The intellectual understanding of that experience is that you are, you are in fact experiencing something which is, has a, a, uh, a uh, very profound vitality, You see that no matter what you experience before as real, nothing can be compared with it because it, you are face to face with a high, the highest level, as it were, of reality. Because by contrast, everything else pales by comparison. Its reality is most intense 
and what one recognizes that it's not anything other than mind itself or intelligence. In this experience, in this experience, one recognizes, as it said in the symposium, that through and in that experience, one realizes uh, the nature of life and what the, the meaning of life, why life is meaningful in that experience. It is, it is not a concept. This is not a concept. This is something to be involved in, to experience. It admits of greater and greater depth to it, but it's the same throughout, yet it admits of greater degrees of depth. Now, look what we have here. See, how can that become, how can that become a model for creation. That's the puzzle. Well, look here. In this experience, one recognizes, you see, not that you are encountering vitality, reality, mind, and intelligence, but you are and experience a oneness with it. It's not that you discover mind over there. You discover that there's no difference between mind your mind, right? It's a oneness. Oh, now look here. If this is this, if this experience is a oneness, including all of that simultaneously and as a whole, and in it one recognizes the goal of life, the meaning of existence. That's not in history. That's not in history. That's only open to the mind and the mind only. That's not in history. That's not in nature. So what do these people do? I call it the reduction of the idea of the good to some unworthy construct which no Platonist ever held and Plato never said. It is nothing other than Europe's continued war against Platonic thought. They want to overcome Plato. If it wasn't for Plato, they wouldn't have any trouble triumphing themselves. They think they are the last stage of human existence because they're the evolutionary stage most completed. You know, but you know, it's really, going back to the idea of potentiality and actuality, this is the full actuality. This is what it means. This is reaching the actuality. And it's not something that lies potentially somewhere. That's absurd. This exists. This is. Our problem is that we are directing our consciousness and all of our concerns, for good reasons, by the way, to the world of becoming, the everyday world. We have lost, we have lost and must reclaim how to understand this problem so we can, as Plato says, turn the mind around so that it can then see what's there to be seen. And that's the goal of the Republic. Therefore, for Lovejoy and people like him, excellence is in that multiplicity of diversity. And for them, this diversity itself is the essence of excellence. However, in the Platonic world, this is the essence of excellence because this is what it is to be a man. Therefore, the people then who represent that to whatever degree they can, they become the model. Because they're trying to model themselves after 
something that is preeminently meaningful. Scholarship gains nothing. Not that it doesn't have its value in helping us preserve texts, helping us preserve the best of our tradition, and therefore scholarship are really in the same class as museum keepers. And that's a good purpose. And it's a fine thing to have in our culture, museum keepers. But they are people, however, who don't want to explore things in that fashion. And if they want to directly engage in it, they have to move from scholarship or take the benefits of scholarship, and there are many, because this very distinction we made about the idea of the good comes out of scholarship. But we have to reach for the best of it and free ourselves from being tangled up with it and not seeing that there is a higher thing to be. And that's the thing we talked about before. As the scholar and the philosopher, we want to move from here to here. Education should help us, the arts should have, you see, the primary function of art from a Platonic vision is show, it's to show in every way we can how significant this is, to be able to represent that as one of the possibilities for human experience, to show why it's so significant and important to us. That's the goal. That's the goal of art. That's what it should be. But currently, we have the romanticist. And what is the romanticist? It's that person who sees that everything that is idiosyncratic, particularly an individual, in themselves and in their work is the highest achievement. I would rather say the highest achievement is to try to show your highest vision, to share your highest vision, communicate it with others, so that we can get along and we can find a higher and more interesting way of relating both to ourselves and to others. So therefore, going back to our good friend Lovejoy, I would like now to say that it's not a history of a failure. Scholarship is the history of failure. And his whole idea that being can be converted to becoming is rather foolish. This is being. This experience is being. And those people who we know that have achieved it and reached it have plenty of evidence of its significance and its transforming effect. And that's the goal of philosophy. Thank you. So, what do you want to talk about? It? I give you a couple of quotes. I can read some quotes if you don't have anything to say. I want to give you some quotes. Well, like I would say that what they're doing is deifying relativism. Oh yes, relativism comes right out of comes right into that, doesn't it? Yes. Does that mean, if that's the case, how does, how does deifying relativism help them then separate them from the church or save the church? Uh, I was, that what, at that moment I was looking at the text. Sorry, Say it again. My understanding, uh, or what I've heard, is that um, modern, modern philosophy saves religion or saves the church. How does a certain kind of a certain kind of uh, how does relativism or this idea save the church then by talking how does relativism about, save maybe, the church how does this save the church or in the sense of not how does relativism save the church I mean, how can some people use the ideas of relativism to support their own faith. Okay. Your ideas are merely your personal private <coughs> idiosyncratic opinion and everyone has a right to one and therefore we can dismiss your views. And therefore, the only thing that is left is the belief I have, which I don't put out. Right. And that's what they might do. And that might be a way in which relativity or relativism 
and reductionism can save faith mm -hmm. by disregarding and trivializing all other views. Yeah, that's one way. And, and yet, at the same time, keeping the possibility that everyone has their own private view, that they can't. Not the possibility, that's all there is that for these. Yeah, 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 yeah. Wow. And I was also thinking that maybe European cultures have language or, or speak through psychoanalytic, or it's peppered with the psychoanalytic terms. I was thinking that Americans seem to have a pepper their language with behaviorism. Yeah, well, behaviorism is another. Wouldn't it be nice to rid our culture of terminology of behaviorism? Response, cunning, reinforced. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Another question before I try something with you? Okay, I'll try something with you. The only quote that Lovejoy has from Plato is this, which we mentioned a moment ago, and I'll draw it since I'm so good at drawing. The whole soul must be wheeled around from that which is subject to becoming. All right, becoming over here. Becoming is the world of appearances, the everyday world. This, right? And we have a soul, and here's a picture of the soul. The soul must be wheeled around to move from the, and becoming involved in, in becoming to being. Now, he's going to call that, sometimes this is called, what truly is. That which is subject to becoming until it's able to endure the contemplation of that which is. Right? So he has to turn his soul around right? so that he can endure the contemplation of what is. This is on page 41. And, and, that usually means something else, doesn't it? I think so. And the most resplendent part thereof. And the most resplendent part. So he's got to do two things, right? He has to endure the contemplation of what is, right? And the most resplendent part thereof, right? Two things. And the quote is, we declare That is the good. We declare that is the good. <clears throat> now, what's interesting, therefore, about this? What? What? Just that we declare it. Yeah. From the text. It's, yeah. We it's, declare. Yeah. We declare popularly, and he ignores the fact that further down in the text there is that beautiful description that I quoted a short while ago about the good begets the idea of the good, and the idea of the good is the same as what is. So that's the only quote he uses in the whole book on Plato. So uh, that's the dangers of scholarship. Uh, you go in with an idea, you back it up with authorities that can support your view, you don't live it, and you don't try to live philosophy, you rather want to preserve certain ideas current in your culture, so that you can become a leading spokesman for it and defend it, rather than trying to reach something that has a greater and more, a more uh, profound basis in existence, uh, reality. Oh. So, thank you guys. Thank you. My pleasure. I always enjoyed going over some of these things. Whatever I'm going to do next week, I don't know. We'll take a look. Thank you. So being called a gentleman and a scholar is not such a big deal. <laughs>
<laughs> no, I, I think I would go along with that. Being called a gentleman and scholar. See, gentleman is a great term. See, a gentleman, not a, <clears throat> a gentleman. Mm. Well, this uh, part and parcel brought about nihilism, relativism. Uh, it, it's totally incapable of understanding why we've had such totally destructive world wars and destruction of 100 million people in the last century. Uh, and this is what gave birth to it, because Hegel, Nietzsche, Marx, Lenin, these people brought about the 20th century, nothing other than we're living out the consequences of this kind of philosophy. Maybe we should stop and try to think of something better. Talk to you next time. Thank you.